Ok, we're, eh, estamos en vivo. Eh, hola, muy buenos días a todas las personas que eh, ya se conectaron a través de las redes de Lógica okay, we're, MX. We're, eh, hola, muy buenos días. Uh -huh. Listo. Estoy, estaba nada más cerrando para que no tengamos eh, sonido viciado. Ok, perfecto. Entonces, estamos comenzando la transmisión. Muchas gracias a quienes ya se conectaron en distintos lugares de México y Latinoamérica y todos los lugares donde nos hacen favor de eh, acompañarnos. Eh, esta ocasión tenemos una mesa muy especial. Eh, vamos a eh, seguir sus preguntas a través de eh, Facebook y de YouTube. Eh, pueden hacer preguntas en español. Y eh, nos va a hacer favor nuestro querido Moisés Macías Bustos de traducirlas de la manera más específica que sea posible para que puedan llegar a nuestros invitados de la mejor forma posible. Este, entonces, si quieren hacer preguntas, ya sea eh, por, por cualquiera de los dos canales, vamos a estar rastreando para poderlas presentar a los ponentes. Y pues eh, nada, entonces comienza ahora a moderar eh, María, por favor. Hi everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, to our speakers or our panelists uh, for accepting our invitation. We are very happy about having this meeting all together. Um, and hello to everybody, wherever you are. Good morning, good evening, good night. If there's anybody in the night watching this. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to, again to thank you, uh, Vincenzo, Luis, Gillian, and Peter for accepting being part of our first international collaboration in the Logica MX. And um, I'm going to start presenting you very briefly, and then we can start moving to the questions so we have enough time for the Q&A. So first of all, I, I'm going to go in alphabetic order. So uh, the first person that I want to present is Vincenzo Krupi. He is a philosopher, uh, also professor of philosophy of science and director of the Center of Logical Language and Cognition at the University of Turin. He, in Italy. He has been working on philosophy of psychology. Uh, interest, he has interest in formal epistemology applied to uh, human reasoning uh, and uh, to psychological reasoning and medical decision making. Now, Luis Estrada Gonzalez, for the Mexicans, he's a very well known um, academic in Mexico. He is a permanent research, researcher at UNAM. Um, and the Institute for Philosophical Research. Uh, he is now a visiting professor at the Nicolas Copernicus University in Turin, in Poland. And he has worked on a very broad range of uh, philosophical topics in logic. So he has worked on logical possibilism, now logical trivialism, and uh, the foundations of contraclassical logics and the universality of relevance. Now, Gillian Russell, Uh, Gillian is also very well known in Mexico. She has been visiting maybe around three times in the last five years. She's a professor at, of philosophy at the Diana Institute of Philosophy at the Australian Catholic University um, in Melbourne, Australia. And she's also a part-time professor fellow, professorial fellow at the Arche Research Center at the University of St. Andrews. She is very famous. Uh, for her logical nihilism thesis, but she has also worked on analytic and synthetic distinction, logics of epistemol uh, logics epistemology, the normativity of logic, and other very interesting philosophical topics. Um, finally, Peter Verde is an associate professor at the University uh, at the Catholic University of Louvain um, at the Institute. Uh, the Superior Institute of Philosophy. He has worked on formal approaches to the feasible reasoning. He's one of the most prominent uh, logicians working on adaptive, on different versions of adaptive logics um, and, and more others. Right now, his main research project focuses on um, logical connections uh, on um, scientific explanation, among others. And he has also worked on logic of paradox and first degree entailment, among other formal systems. And I am Maria Martinez Ordaz. I'm going to be the chair of this session. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, 
Thank you, Vincenzo. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Luis. So what about we start with the first question, which is um, almost every time that we talk about non-classical logics, we talk about the failures of classical logics. So why, why we don't talk about which are the virtues of that classical logic has, what type of phenomena, um, which according to you are the most important virtues of classical logic, and which are those elements of classical logic that we want to preserve the most, even when adopting an alternative logic, and why are they so valuable? So um, do any of you want to, want to start with this question? Gillian, please. Thanks, Maria. Uh, buenos dias, anyone, everyone. Um, so I, I really like classical logic. It's not the only logic that I like, but I find it easy to think of things about it that I do like. Um, so one thing that comes to mind to start with is it's usually um, the logic that people learn first. And when you um, think about all the kind of thoughts that people have about logic and about what follows from what before they start studying any formal theory of entailment, um, there's a lot of sort of um, disparate ideas, some of which are not like completely true, but are like sort of right. So, so I'm thinking of things like if you're reading a detective story, you'll sometimes hear the detective say something like, well, I can't prove that something doesn't exist or I can't prove a negative um, or something like that. Um, sometimes people say, oh, I can't prove general claims. And I think one of the things that you get out of um, classical first order logic is the thought that, well, it's not that there's nothing to that idea, but there are techniques that work in special situations for proving a negative or for proving a general claim. So if you can use the proof technique of reductio ad absurdum, then you will be able to prove a negative in certain cases. Um, or if you can reason about arbitrary objects, then you will be able to establish a general claim. And not, not just these kind of tricky cases where there's like a refinement of the idea that turns out to be right, but like all kinds of thoughts where you think, um, okay, if this holds, then it won't be the case that not this holds, right? So sort of from P to not not P, you might be think, well, yeah, there's something right about that. Or also something like say modus ponens. Um, so if P then Q, P therefore Q, you think, yeah, that sounds, that sounds right. And if you start studying uh, classical logic, and you learn like how to assign truth values to sentences and then the classical truth tables, like how to compute the truth values of complex sentences based on the truth values of their parts. And then you have this idea of something that's gonna be a logical truth if it comes out true on every row of the truth table, then you end up with this like very systematic, very unified explanation for like what's right about those things, what they have in common. And um, that, I guess, is one thing that I, I really like about classical logic. And in other logics, I would like to be able to um, copy some of that like systematicity and unification of the explanation. Thank you, Gillian. Um, Luis, do you want to, to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that the most important virtue of classical logic is uh, that it has an excellent public relations department. So, no, uh, more seriously. Uh, uh, for simplicity, I would take uh, here um, a logic as a collection of valid arguments, right? And uh, a collection of valid arguments can be specified or presented in several ways. And a nice thing about classical logic is that um, the semantics for it are very simple in a sense, and they have uh, most of the times uh, very nice mathematical properties. Uh, I'm not really sure if, 
if there is something special about some of those arguments that we value the most or, or anything like that. But definitely for some presentations, uh, we would like something like that for uh, different logics, right? Uh, we would like to have uh, that kind of semantics for, for other logics. And because when we uh, analyze uh, some of the uh, arguments, uh, for example, those that uh, Julian mentioned it, I'm not sure that they are uh, typically classical in a strong sense. I mean, they are shared by many other logics. And uh, so at this point, I, I'm, I'm, I am a bit hesitant if, if there is something to classical logic that makes it uh, I don't know, so, so important for us, but I will leave it there. Thank you, thank you, Luis. Uh, Vincenzo, do you have any anything that you want to add to this? Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, there was, in fact, in fact, you, 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 you may know or, or not that I'm not a logician myself. Um, uh, you said so. So my, I, I'm, I'm here like a little bit of an observer. I'm not doing much research in logic myself. So whether or not this is going to be useful for the discussion, we will see. But um, starting from this point of um, classical logic. So one thing that I wanted to mention is um, I happen to have sort of fairly um, sort of conservative, one might say, maybe realist inclinations in, in, meta, in philosophical matters such as uh, semantics and epistemology. And that, and that sort of um, motivates a default positive attitude uh, towards certain foundational properties of classical logic like uh, yeah, non-contradiction, bivalence, I guess. Um, but that's, of course, I mean, that was just a matter of, uh, you know, um, putting, putting the cards on the table um, because, well, uh, you cannot easily preserve those things if you want to go no classical, I suppose. So, so um, the other thing, when, when it comes to uh, what you want to preserve, uh, one thing that I sometimes um, try to keep track of is whether certain uh, locally very plausible inference rules can be preserved, like, like modus ponens, as, as Gillian uh, mentioned before. So, and the reason is, is, very, is very down to earth is that, of course, there might be, there might be um, uh, very sophisticated theoretical reasons to come up with, uh, with logical theories where something like that fails. But on the other hand, you should you surely pay a price of uh, kind of a detachment from prevailing patterns of inference uh, including the ones that you find in the sciences, which which I uh, would would uh, look at with with uh, caution, let's say. Uh, so that's that's my first thoughts uh, about this. Thank you, thank you, Vincenzo. And with that, um, Peter, can can we hear your your answer yeah. to this? Sure. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great uh, honor to be here. Um, and um, to answer this question, so I largely agree with uh, the other um, people who have already uh, spoken. Uh, but uh, I think simplicity is maybe the biggest virtue. So, and that's been said already, but uh, we, we start with, um, I, I believe that all of us, uh, all people, in fact, have uh, some intu intuitions about inference. We infer all the time. And um, we do this with language. Language contains uh, things that look like logical connectives. Uh, so there's all this kind of intuitions about it, and it functions relatively well in circumstances that are familiar to us. And then, um, well, if you if you really analyze, start analyzing these inferences, these inference patterns, it's often incoherent as a total. Um, I mean, if you teach logic to students, then they will will be quite easy to give them like benchmark cases uh, of things that they accept, and then uh, they will not be able to accept other things which they would also like to accept, and so on. So they will easily find out that uh, their their intuitive inference patterns are actually form an incoherent system. 
Now, classical logic has this kind of, uh, it's like a very simple system that uh, uh, kind of already gives uh, an explanation to a lot of these inference patterns. Uh, a lot of them will fail too, and, and a lot of things that, that they will not find acceptable patterns will turn out to be, uh, um, to be derivable. Um, but but all right, uh, if it's an incoherent uh, a total of things, then anyway, there will be some things that fall out. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of a good uh, theoretical system that uh, that that captures some of these basic shared inferences. Um, and and I think in general, once you focus on, uh, on, on on true functions, on, on connectors that are true functions, which is at least in mathematics and in computer science and so on, uh, used in effect, uh, then, um, and then ask about truth preservation, if you equate uh, a validity with truth preservation, well, then you get classical logic easily. Um, and in these circumstances, that's well studied. It's very important to study this properly. Um, and well, I think there's there's some beauty in there, and 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 if we, if we, even if we want to criticize classical logic to some point, um, we need to have a place to start. Uh, we cannot start building up logic out of nowhere, um, and so it's good to have this kind of simple basis. Um, and what did I want to add to that? Um, well, to, if we want to preserve things, but I don't think there's kind of an absolute preservation requirement of some aspects of classical logic, but I think that, and I, th I think Vincenzo was going into that direction. Um, I think there may be some local inferences uh, that, that to, to use his words, uh, that, are, that should still, that when there's no reason to attack them, then you should try to uh, uh, give a theory that 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 says that why they are valid, um, such as modus ponens, but I also think uh, disjunctive syllogism, and many other uh, introduction of conjunction. These are principles that are oft very often used in in, in natural reasoning, um, and if you don't have a good reason to uh, to 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 destroy them, uh, then at least you should say why they are in some circumstances uh, where they are usually used, still valid. So I think once you try to combine the, the critical approach with a sort of conservative uh, approach of, of preserving as much as possible um, and only destroying whatever um, should this be destroyed, let's say. So. Thank you, Peter. And and with that, maybe we is it's very easy to connect to the second question. Considering all these virtues that you mentioned, simplicity, the familiarity, and the intuitiveness, in a sense of some classical inferences and so on. Um, considering all these virtues of classical logic, which type of phenomena ha have you considered that is better to motivate to revise the usefulness or the applicability of classical logic? In, in certain contexts, such as mathematical, scientific, empirical, social context, among others. Gillian, do you want to, to say something about this? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind for me um, are various linguistic phenomena. Um, and I don't know whether, it, is it gonna be okay for me to share my screen, put together a very simple diagram that I think yeah, yeah, would I like- sure. Go explain host. this easily. So let me try this. Is that working? Yes. Okay, good. So there's this standard assumption in at least a standard way of presenting classical logic that um, each sentence is going to have one of two truth values, that it's either going to be true or it's going to be false. And so like in these little truth tables, we've got one for true and zero for false. And you can see the, the truth table for negation. So this one here says that if the sentence gets one, then the negation of that sentence gets zero. And if it gets zero, then the negation gets one. And then there's a little truth table for disjunction that says, well, if one of the disjuncts is true, that's gonna be enough to make the whole thing true. And then, Given those assumptions, we can put together this table for the law of excluded middle. So we've got 
phi or not phi. And then it turns out whether phi is true or whether phi is false. So on either of these rows, that disjunction gets one. And so we say, okay, it's always gonna be true. It's a logical truth. But there are some linguistic phenomena that make me question this assumption that every sentence has to be true or false. So, so here are two examples. Let me see if I can turn the page. Okay, so um, vagueness and reference failure. So you might have this simple sentence, A is red, and you might think that A could refer to like any point in this um, sort of red orangey block. And I think if it refers to a point over here, then the sentence A is red is gonna be true. And I think if it refers to a point over here on the left, well, those points look orange to me. And so I would say the sentence A is red is gonna be false and it's negation. A is not red is gonna be true. But there are some points in the middle that I have trouble saying whether or not they're orange or whether they're red. And here's something you might want to say. You might want to say that A is red has no truth value where A picks out one of those points. It's not the only thing you could say, but it's one um, story that you might tell. And then you might also think that A is not red, has no truth value at that point. So you wanna say something like, that point is not red and it's not, not red. That's, that's one thought that might make you question the idea that every sentence is either true or false. And then a different one is reference failure. So what if it turned out that A fails to pick out a point? right? Maybe it has no reference. And we might think that natural language sentences can have expressions in them that fail to pick anything out. Um, so maybe Pegasus or like some mythological or some like badly introduced names, you might think they fail to have a reference. And then you say, well, what about the sentence A is red where A has no reference? Well, maybe that sentence fails to express a proposition. And the only way sentences get truth values is by expressing propositions that have truth values. And in that case, this case, the sentence is gonna to fail to get a truth value. Okay, so a couple of reasons to think that there might be sentences that are neither true nor false. And so you might want your logic to encompass a third truth value. So here we've got this hashtag, um, oh, in America, I think it's a pound um, uh, truth value. And then we can extend the truth tables for negation and disjunction. So here we've just assumed that if phi gets hashtag, then not phi will get hashtag as well. And if both phi and psi get hashtag, then the disjunction of phi and psi is gonna get hashtag. And so then you go back to the table for the law of excluded middle at the bottom here. And now there's a row of the truth table on which that sentence gets hashtag which means there's a row of the truth table on which it's not true, which means if your conception of logical truth was sentences that are true on every interpretation, it's not gonna be a logical truth anymore. Okay, so that's, that's like one kind of argument that I think is really interesting for dropping classical logic and dropping some of the theorems of classical logic. It's, um, you have language that is in some ways richer than what we were assuming when we put classical logic together. And so that, that ends up giving you different results. Okay, I'll stop sharing, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gillian, for such an interactive uh, participation. So um, any, anybody else, maybe Vincenzo, do you want to, to say something about scientific context, please? Right, so, so I think I might, I might take a, a very different angle. Let's see if, if, this, if this fits. Um, uh, the, the, the topic uh, somehow. So one, one thing that I, I happen to, to be a kind of Bayesian, so I, 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 I sort of think that we should, that it's very useful to analyze um, uh, reasoning and, and rational inquiry by means of probability theory. And, and so one problem that, one thing that you have uh, in, a, in a sort of classical, um, development of this idea is that every logical fact should get probability one. So that's, that's what you get in classical probability theory. And the reason is that um, textbook uh, presentations of the, of the formalism um, make probability entirely grounded on a underlying classical logical apparatus, right? 
and that is a constraint is meant to be a constraint the, the probability one is meant to be a constraint on on the on probability functions now it's it definitely seems to be the case that sometimes in philosophical work you might want to say that someone might rationally have degree less than one about something that is a logical truth for for different reasons the the general phenomenon here would be logical learning right so when we learn something that is, is allegedly logical but but we, we can find out that and sometimes that takes uh, so much effort and these and this idea so if that has to happen somehow um there must be something non-classical going on in these in these foundations of of the uh, treatment of of the graded uh, beliefs so there is some philosophical work some technical work in this direction i i i, I don't have a solution i don't think there is a entirely uh, you know um, consensual solution to such a problem but surely it is something that that pops up when you think about uh, the kind of um, uh, topics that i happen to to address for we have one big problem in uh, the philosophy of science it's a very traditional one that that is called the problem of old evidence and and part of that problem is that sometimes it seems to be very important for scientists uh, to find out certain logical connections between theory and evidence in order to change their mind or or refine their credences so that's one um a connection that that might push someone to look um, into something in that direction and another thing is that if you think about uh, this is a, maybe maybe a, a bit less uh, sort of um, mainstream, but if you think about the philosophy of mathematics itself in a, in a philosophy of science kind of way, right? Um, for sure, we do discover logical facts, and and for sure, we might think of of up to a point, we might think of of mathematicians themselves as Bayesian Bayesian agents, and if you if you want to do that, then again, you have this kind of uh, need to account for for learning logical things um, so uh, this is just another way to say that um, there is a connection of, of course it's not it's, it's a subtle connection but there is a connection between classical logic and the assumption of logical omniscience somehow and and um, to that extent at least from my point of view as I said I, I look at this stuff a bit from the outside at least uh, in my view this might be a motivation to to look a bit farther and, and deeper. Um, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know, Peter or Luis, do you want to answer? Also, you can interrupt um, a question to go back to another problem or something like that. So uh, if, if none of you want specifically to answer that question, we can move to the next. Peter, do you want to say something? Yes. Sure. sure. Um... Well, there, there's a lot, there's a lot of phenomena I think that that pushes to 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 at least question classical logic whether we want to revise it. Then is is, an, is yet another question. But um, so so there's of course the problems of vagueness that that that's something that I've been um, well, fascinated by since the beginning of my my time that I started thinking about logic. Um, and I think we haven't yet uh, obtained a very uh, successful solution for these problems. Uh, but definitely, Soraitis paradoxes uh, uh, push us to do something, uh, uh, to, to explain something there, because of the amount of vague predicates in, in, in natural language. Uh, but next to that, there's also problems of, 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 of material implication. Um, I think this is, um, while in general, one could claim that usual disjunctions are true functions, same with conjunctions. I think it's more questionable that conditionals are true functional. Um, and I think most philosophers nowadays uh, um, accept that they are not. Um, but the, the entailment relations are quite similar. So there's also problems with relevance if you have entailment relations, usually in natural language, but also in scientific language. People do not um, accept principles like uh, monotonicity or weakening uh, when they are considering um, entailment relations. Even mathematicians will hardly ever utter uh, um, entailment relations with completely irrelevant uh, uh, premises. Um, so then you can say this is purely a matter of, um, 
of pragmatics. Like it, it, you just just something you're not supposed to say um, if there's an irrelevant premise. Um, uh, but nevertheless, it's valid in a sort of uh, higher sense. Um, but that doesn't really uh, sort of that doesn't give a solution. That's just pushing it away. Um, and so we should have a theory, I believe, uh, of conditionals of entailment relations that at least accounts for this intuitively very strong requirement of relevance. Uh, so the, 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 that actually all the premises that you mentioned in an entailment relation, uh, a valid entailment relation, are actually um, um, useful for the, for the validity, as we usually do in, in, in non uh, uh, non-technical logical uh, uh, statements. Um, so I'm not talking about the object language of, la of, of mathematicians, but, but uh, the, the sort of meta language they use, like um, uh, theorem one is, uh, is a consequence of, uh, of lemma one and axiom two. Uh, these kind of statements, if you add uh, axiom three there, or you add uh, lemma 16, uh, then this will not be any more an acceptable um, entailment statement, I believe, um, to make, uh, because you want to, when you communicate about inferences, you want to, to, to push, to, 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 to focus on the stuff you actually used in them. To, you want to have some kind of a, a, a an, uh, you want to communicate something about relations of um, entailment between things and not stuff that is completely irrelevant to it. Uh, I think this, this phenomenon is everywhere where people infer stuff. Um, and, and I think it calls, uh, it, it should call logicians uh, uh, for, for, for an answer to say, how, how, how does it come that, how can we capture this phenomenon of uh, requiring um, entailment statements with relevant premises with, 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 with premises that actually do something. Um, even though then we still might say, well, truth preservation has this feature of monotonicity or weakening. Um, and there, uh, this, this, this is fine. There still seems to be an interesting relation where relevance phenomena, and I think it's true also for conditionals, but also for entailment relations, where this uh, plays a role very important role in communicating about inference uh, uh, in almost all sciences and, and, and including mathematics. mathematics. Uh, so that's something that, that, that re recent, recently mainly has, uh, has, has fascinated me a lot. And it's all the more present in philosophy. I mean, I don't know whether that's a science, but uh, people start often making mistakes as soon as if then statements are concerned because they had, all, they had some classes into classical logic they studied uh, uh, material implication there, but nevertheless, they are human people, human agents who who uh, who who who, um, who use their their conditionals in a way that it's relevant. Uh, so there's often very big misunderstandings between philosophers who combine those two. Who, when they speak naturally, they use it correctly, or they use it. Um, in such a way that they're that they that it's required to have relevant links, and then when they go in their more sophistic nature uh, and try to attack each other, and uh, and 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 try to formalize maybe partly an argument, then all of a sudden they come back to the the, the well understood and the, the thing they studied in 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 logic one hundred and one, uh, uh, the material truth table. So we have a clear uh, clash there. Um, and, and I think, um, well, logic should, should, logic should account for, for, for this clash and, and, and where it goes wrong with material implication. Sorry, it was a bit long. No, that's, that's perfect. Actually, uh, because the following questions are, and I'm going to try to merge them, are going to be focusing on human reasoning. So something that has emerged during this conversation is that uh, one of the main motivations for changing the logic is that humans do not reason exactly as classical logic would say we should do. And so uh, which do you think are the most important challenges? Um, some of you have already mentioned them uh, of classical logic when applied to human reasoning. And if there is any insight that we have to consider when choosing 
an alternative logic or to change the logic when addressing human reasoning. But also there is the question of whether logic, um, either classical or non-classical logics, can uh, provide us with explanations about human reasoning. And so something that I know because I, I have known Luis for a long time is that Luis doesn't really commit to this relation between reasoning and it, uh, human reasoning and the choice of the logical choice. So maybe um, Luis, can you say something about this opposed totally to the questions? And then we can move to other participants, of course. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as you say, I, I'm not uh, especially interested in the connections. A believer. Yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in the connections uh, between logic and, and reasoning. Um, not because I think there are no relations, but it's simply that the topic is uh, too huge for me. I, I'm not that smart. I, I prefer dealing with other topics. Um, and, but then I, I will give a, an answer to the previous question, okay? Because for me, the context for challenging classical logic has been the practice of doing logic itself, right? Uh, think, for example, uh, when you uh, are dealing with a proof in natural deduction, and you have to prove a conditional, and then you are said, oh, okay, uh, in order to prove a conditional, put the antecedent as a hypothesis, and then prove the consequent. And to my mind, to my mind the, the, there is a lot of philosophy involved there because uh, one can start wondering, okay, just putting the antecedent as a, a hypothesis is using actually a, that part of the sentence. Uh, if I manage to prove the consequent, did I prove it from the antecedent or the antecedent was just there floating in the, I, I don't know, that, that sort of, of, of dealing with some proofs uh, made me wonder about uh, classical logic. And on, on the other hand, it's, it's not just on the proof theoretic side, right? Also the truth tables are uh, among the most mysterious things in, in, in this planet because um, for all of us that are, we are used to, to classical logic, we almost immediately read classical logic from the truth tables, but that's not immediate. Uh, classical logic is not uh, embedded essentially in the truth tables. Uh, there are a couple of nice examples. For example, uh, Neil Tennant uh, showed how to how to extract a sort of uh, constructed logic from the truth tables, and Richard Silvan, uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly, obtained FDE from the truth tables, right? But that shows that uh, there is something else in the truth tables. Uh, the, the truth tables are, are not, uh, do not contain uh, classical logic. So uh, that practice of, uh, of doing logic uh, was uh, what uh, led me to think in long classical stuff. Uh, if that has something to do with reasoning, uh, I don't know, but that was my personal tragedy. <laughs> Thank you, Luis. Uh, so any, anybody um, want to say something closer to the actual reasoning interest? <laughs> More than the Luis reasoning interest? Peter, please. Yeah, uh, so, so I think I know people, many people, many very, very, very intelligent people have questioned this, uh, this line that, 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 that logic should be about reasoning. Um, and there's good arguments to question it, but I think it's a little bit, it's a pity. Um, uh, so, so we want to understand uh, human language better and to, to make it better by understanding it better, to explicate it and therefore maybe improve our skills in understanding our own language. Um, and it's the language we reason with. So, so it's it, for me those two questions of better understanding what we're saying, um, 
and when we use logical language, what exactly it means, um, and then how we reason with that language. Uh, I think these are both tasks of logic. And then there is other questions like validity and laws of truth and so on. Uh, and these are very important. Uh, and a third thing is the just the, log the technical study of systems as, as mathematical, mathematical uh, tools, let's say, or mathematical objects. Um, and both, both, uh, all three of these tasks are important, um, but there is something extremely platonistic about the second one, the thinking about validity as such, independent of reasoning or independent of humans, independent of, uh, of scientific practices. Um, I, I, I never met or observed validity, I never met or observed truth. Uh, and um, it, it's a bit like, like reducing ethics to thinking about the goods or aesthetics to thinking about the, the, the beauty or beauty. Um, it, well, I hope uh, ethics can also be about how we should, what we should do, um, how we should guide our lives uh, and, 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 and find reasons for our actions. Um, and well, logic is then about finding better ways to, 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 to guide our inferential practices and our cognitive practices and our, um, our theorizing practices. Uh, I, I hope logic can do that. I don't think we're there yet. Uh, so I think it's a very difficult task and I think it's extremely, we should extremely be modest about this. Um, uh, I don't think logic has, uh, has accomplished a lot till this point, but we're slowly getting there. There are more and more tools, there are modal logics, there, there's all kinds of ways to really start explicating human reasoning better in a normative sense uh, um, as, as guiding our reasoning, as ways to guide our reasoning. Um, so yes, I hope logic can do more than that, but I don't think we're there yet. Uh, and and, and classical, uh, classical logic can do it definitely on its own, not too much in that respect. Uh, so I see where the kind of uh, more um, careful approach comes from, but it should be our long-term goal, in my opinion, to, to understand reasoning better. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I would like to press Vincenzo into these questions because as, as he mentioned um, and I mentioned at the beginning, he is a philosopher of science who has been working on applying formal tools, some of which we consider to be logics, uh, into the study of human reasoning. And so I was wondering if you think if any of these formal tools or logics could provide us with explanations about human reasoning or rationality and which type of explanations would they be and so on. So if you have any thoughts on this, they, they would be very well, much welcome. Yeah, sure, sure. No, yes. Uh, so there are many, I mean, even, even this, this um, uh, question about the connection between logic and reasoning is of course, um, actually a, a overlap of different, of different issues. So my, one of the things that I've been thinking about a little bit comes from this, um, uh, sort of uh, involvement into um, the study of reasoning where th this is meant to be essentially psychologists, uh, cognitive psychologists uh, studying, studying reasoning. So that's, that's a different take from like, for instance, the many matters of language and language use. It's, it's not really the same thing. So in terms of this, um, of this connection, uh, well, of course, uh, let, me, let me start out saying that of course, um, there are, there are many different ways to study logic. So um, Peter mentioned the, the mathematical study of the logic or the, or the mathematical properties of different systems. Of course, that's that's perfectly fine by itself, and it's it's a uh, very um, interesting and and self-contained, as you were, uh, kind of of endeavor. Um, there is a matter of the of the debate on on what the right kind of logic would be as a benchmark for correct reasoning. I, I think, of course, that really depends on, on different views. There are people that don't like this kind of framing of the question by itself, but still, in other cases, we we think we we happen to to talk about that as well, which is of course a a, a tricky issue, and it's meant to be 
something normative in a sense, and, and some people think that is just mis mis misleading. Um, when it comes to, to logic as, as a, a tool for modeling reasoning with, with empirical goals, right? So we, we want to uh, sort of account for, for things that people do. Now, I have sort of mixed feelings about this because on the one hand, I am totally in favor of formal tools in, in, in basically any science, right? I think, I think it's, it's a good um, heuristic to try to come up with uh, um, sort of explicit, uh, formally characterized um, elements of explanation or, or uh, interpretation of understanding of phenomena. So that's, that's for sure. And in fact, uh, one interesting point is that some of these experimental uh, disciplines, like um, among other things, the psychology of reasoning itself, they suffer from like a little bit of a, uh, I would say a uh, lack of theoretical development. And that is interesting because sometimes we have this connection with people coming from other fields, including logic and formal epistemology, providing some of kind of theoretical material for, for integrating the research in, the, in those areas. And, and that is surely something interesting uh, to see. However, I should also say that um, in many of these attempts, it's true that in many cases, some kind of non-classical logics have been involved. So for instance, non-monotonic uh, logical systems have, have sometimes been involved in this kind of uh, modeling exercise uh, in order to, to, to explain and account for, for uh, uh, psychological phenomena about reasoning. Uh, I should say, um, many such attempts have, have not met much success in my view. And that there is a subtle reason for that is that if you, if, you do the, if you do that, then you should play by the rules of empirical science, right? So, so logical theorizing can be a powerful source of ideas or motivation, but then ultimately the success of the endeavor is going to be you know, empirical success, predictions, and so on and so forth. And that sometimes doesn't, doesn't work um, um, really, really well with these, with these uh, projects. But, but of course, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing and, and you should go uh, on a case by case um, sort of assessment because as Maria said, sometimes I've, I've been trying myself to contribute with some bits of formal epistemology to account for certain um, things going on in, in the psychology of reasoning. And for those, for those cases, I, I'm, I'm ready to claim success, full success. Um, so, so yes, I mean, that's, that's more or less what I, what I could offer here. Yeah. Th thank you, uh, everybody. So this connects very nicely with the next question, which is methodological and focuses on which do you think are going to be the best or the most successful or more handy methodological guidelines that you consider that would help us to, to say something when dealing with theory choice and logic, which are the general criteria that you think one should or could uh, use to guide their choice in this respect. So. Maybe Gillian, do you want to say something? Um, so overall, I'm really sympathetic to this very sort of general anti-exceptionalist abductive approach to the epistemology of logic. So um, when you're trying to decide which or whether either of two logics are any good, um, you should see like, first of all, whether they're getting stuff right about the entailment relation, at least to the extent that you can tell, right? So um, the reason that I think, um, say the trivial logic, the logic from which you can get everything from any set of premises at all is wrong is that I don't think that say snow is white follows from grass is green. And so um, as far as I can tell, any logic that says it does is getting the entailment relation wrong. But then, you know, once you've used um, as much as you can tell from that data to figure out like which theories you can rule out, um, it becomes really important to think about various theoretical virtues like simplicity, like the ability to provide unified explanations of different phenomena, um, things like elegance, things like not being too ad hoc. All that um, is sort of boring. Like anybody who takes my rough, like, um, uh, approach to the epistemology of logic thinks something like that. And then of course, all the fighting is about which is the simpler, which is the most elegant, things like that. Um, 
But I think one thing um, that I really have learned by reading other people and by thinking about this is that which virtues a logic appears to have can change quite a lot with new developments or with different ways of looking at it. So one thing is like, whether you're thinking of it as say, um, a version of a sequent calculus proof system or whether you're approaching it like model theoretically can make a difference to how simple say, I don't know, intuitionistic logic is compared to classical logic. Um, and since, you know, it's not obvious that one of those approaches should be privileged, um, it's not obvious that simplicity is gonna decide in a straightforward way um, between those logics. And then the other thought is that uh, new developments can make a big difference to how simple things look. And the really like standout example that comes to mind for me is modal logics and looking at the system, systems from say Lewis and Langford where we had all of these complicated systems. And as far as I could tell, I was supposed to be able to look at all these different systems and think, oh yeah, intuitively, this one seems to be right, or this one seems to be right. But these systems were like lists of axioms and each axiom I could barely remember, never mind like judge whether it was intuitively correct. And then Kripke came along with the modal uh, model theory. And, you know, initially I could have thought this is all too complicated. This is just somebody imagining that like, you know, when they look at these axioms, this one gets a star and, and this one doesn't. I could suddenly see that there was this unity to the explanation and a way of like simplifying how they all tied together um, from this new work. And so I think um, uh, one thing that um, is good to remember and that isn't always obvious um, is that which systems have which properties can change a lot with new developments in logic. Okay, thanks. Th thank you, Gillian. I think that's also useful even for philosophy of science. That's a very good reflection. So um, any, anybody else wants to suggest something maybe different, maybe the same, maybe fight Yilian on this? Um, Vincenzo? Well, I, I might have a few uh, minor points of disagreement maybe. Um, so I, I have been having a look at this anti-exceptionalist uh, literature and, and, I, and I like the general uh, idea. Uh, I, I have this background of, of uh, philosophy, traditional philosophy of science, general philosophy of science. And um, there's two kinds of uh, relatively minor points that, that uh, I still think are not uh, irrelevant to, to clear up a little bit that the discussion that is, on the one, which, which comes somehow from, from the uh, um, uh, general philosophy of science tradition, as it were. The first thing is a very basic point. So when we want to talk about theory assessment, we, we should be a bit careful about what a theory is. So for instance, I would be willing to say that Lewis and Langsford is not the same thing as, as Kripke. Uh, you can think it, they are along a line of development, somehow a project or a program or something, I don't know. But, but um, uh, it, it really matters in a sense to see uh, what is the theory that we are assessing. I mean, going into a bit of the details of what are the contents, uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a general point. I'm not entirely sure about the example, but I have this inclination that to say that uh, this is something to be, to be careful about. Um, I don't think there is any contradiction, but, but it's, it's, a, it's part of the exercise of clarifying what it means to assess uh, theory and choice theory when they, when they, um, when they compete. Uh, another thing is that I happen to be a, a predictivist in the, in the philosophy of science. So I think that uh, there is essentially one virtue that is empirical success for empirical science, sciences, uh, which means I think we should, uh, and we can, I mean, this is, this is probably a minority position, but anyway, I think we should and we, and we can basically trace back the meaningful part of virtues such as simplicity and, and coherence and these kind of things to something. I mean, we should, we, should, we, can, we should be able to rephrase them, the relevant part, the epistemically relevant part of these virtues in terms of successful predictions, basically. Um, now, there is a problem about novelty. But th this is something that we can, we can address. We have the problem of novelty already in the empirical science because we, can we, we must be able to talk about sort of 
predictions of already known facts. I mean, th this would be used novel facts that are explained without being accommodated, right? So we have the notion already from the empirical science and we can use that. So to this extent, I would be willing to say that the um, traditional multi-attribute model of, um, of theory choice that comes from, from Kuhn, that, that's one thing that you find in the literature, is really um, unduly weak. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can do a bit better if we focus on, on the right kind of um, uh, evidential support connection. And we can find that from in, the, in the methodology of empirical science, including this idea of uh, generating sort of non ad hoc uh, successful accounts of phenomena. So, so I think this problem of weighing different virtues is really a difficulty that uh, that's my position. I mean, I think that there are resources to, to address that uh, effectively and actually almost solve it from, from the methodological reflection in philosophy of science after Kuhn up to, well, uh, recent times. The, the, the key problem that I find, and I, I, I have a feeling that, that Gillian is actually more or less um, on the same line, is that it's, it's, very, it's not easy to, to see what the evidence is in the case of, of logical theories, right? And, and how we can um, sort of achieve firm um, sort of grounds in terms of the evidential basis for, for uh, theory choice in, in logic. That is a problem uh, which is still a bit of a mystery to me. Um, I, I, I hope that at some point we get a solution to that, but at this point I'm really uncertain. Thank you, Vincenzo. Uh, Luis or Peter? Oh, Gillian wants to respond. Yes, Gillian. Is that okay? Um, yes, that's just perfect. Two, two tiny points. So um, the first issue was on, on, on like, what is the theory, especially in the case of the modal logic and the question of whether, say, Lewis and Langford's theories were the same as Kripke's theories. So I think usually when we're talking about a logic there's, there's at least two parts to the theory. Like one is the entailment relation that it generates on a particular language. Um, and then there's like the mechanism that generates that entailment relation. So that might be model theoretic or it might be proof theoretic or something else. Um, but usually there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in like classical logic about two truth values and here's how you draw your tables. And um, so the, the thing that's really in common between what ends up being the main Lewis and Langford um, systems and the um, Kripke systems is, is that they generate the same logic that we can give this soundness and completeness proof for say Lewis and Langford's um, axiomatic proof systems using the, the Kripke semantics. So they end up matching up and having the same entailment relation. But I'm happy to say that they are different theories and that, that you know, they generate these results um, in different ways that, that totally makes sense. So what it, what it kind of indicated was the logic, not necessarily like the axiomatic proof system on its own or the, you know, this methodology for going about um, getting it. Um, I also um, deeply interested and confused by um, and one answers about uh, what the data is in the case of logic. Like, um, and I, I think um, it is a bit hard to see. And there's, there's this danger whenever it's hard to figure out what it is, we sort of fall back on talking about our intuitions about it. And I think people are always tempted to do this in logic that somehow the data is um, ordinary people's or maybe just logicians, intuitions that go like valid or, or not valid. And I think we would never do that in like respectable sciences like physics and say, well, what we need to explain is my like intuition that the dial is pointing to like the, you know, uh, little needle is pointing to five on this dial or something like that. And then we want to explain like, why is it pointing to five? Why are we getting this um, result? Um, so I hope that getting a better answer to exactly what the data and logic is will like allow us to step away from constantly falling back on like people's intuitions about what's valid. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Gillian. Uh, Peter, do you want to say something on this question, please? Yeah, um, I would as a sort of, um, I agree with, with, with most of what has been said, but I would like to add some, some methodological aspect that, uh, that I think is very important. Um, and 
what, what I like about logic is how it is a very interdisciplinary and um, I'd say extremely self-critical discipline. Um, like you have inputs from a lot of fields uh, from, from deep metaphysics to, uh, to psychology of reasoning to, uh, to computer science uh, and, and artificial intelligence. And I think this is extremely important, like uh, keeping this link uh, uh, between the, the deep foundations of, 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 of knowledge or of truth uh, uh, in, in metaphysics uh, to very empirical aspects um, and to not try to situate logic uh, somewhere there, uh, like a purely empirical discipline or a, uh, a purely metaphysical discipline or something like it, it it's floating and it's nicely floating uh, the floating is a is a virtue rather than floating nature is a virtue rather than uh, a, a problem um and 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 i find it remarkable that things like dilithium uh, is actually possible uh, that we can revise such a deep fundamental principles uh, that everybody takes for granted um and, and that it's well respected, can be studied, and so on, uh, uh, without much problem. Um, I think that, that 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 that's a wonderful sign of a very open and um, and dynamic discipline. Um, and I think we should keep it that way. Uh, uh, this 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 not make it purely speculative from empirical data, whatever these data are. Uh, and and also not make it uh, purely a foundational discipline or something, but try to uh, go to in both directions. Uh, try to get insights from the metaphysics and try to uh, uh, correct the foundational tendencies of metaphysics um, and of, of foundations of mathematics. Let's say uh, uh, by by confronting us to cases where um, logical intuitions uh, really fail. And, and for these logical intuitions, let's also use empirical data. Let's actually uh, study what people, what scientists, what mathematicians um, intuitively think about what are correct inferences and so on. Um, not because we have to accept them and give a theory that uh, uh, makes most metaphysicians be right about uh, their own inferences, but, but as, as inputs to construct a, a new a logical theories. Um, which are normative, so so not not a purely psychologistic approach, but the input is very important, I think, from both directions, from like the ground, from, from bottom up, uh, from really the the, the the foundational aspects of philosophy up to uh, uh, also take into account the actual practice um, of a scientist, of a mathematician, um, of of judges in court, uh, and try to uh, clash those two. Uh, there's two very, very different uh, um, aspects. I think, I think that's uh, something that we're doing to some extent, uh, but there's a danger of specialization where people are going to uh, 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 not anymore do this horrible task of standing in the middle and being insulted by both sides. Uh, um, uh, I think it's important to, 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 to take both into account. And maybe there's more than, than two, uh, actually, because there's also the, 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 the computer science input and so on. Um, but... Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Vincenzo has a follow up on your response. Uh, Vincenzo. Is it, is it possible to just, yes. just because I, sorry, if that's not helpful, just forget about it. But I, I, was, I was thinking again about the crypt case. Um, and I'm not sure whether the analogy is, is okay, but this, if, to the extent, in a sense, it conveys my, my, my concern. So you, the logician, will tell me if that makes sense. So think about Newton and Kepler, right? Okay, so we had the laws, uh, the kinematic laws of the, of the planets, that was Kepler, right? They, they were already there. At some point, we get the theory uh, talking about forces. Of course, it, it implies many more things, but, but let's forget about that. So what about the connection between Newton and, and Kepler? One thing that happens is that if you take, for instance, the first law of Kepler, and then you employ Newton's law, then you can derive logically the second uh, law of Kepler. 
right? So this, this structure, sometimes you, 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 you uh, account for that in terms of unification. I like to think that it's a different thing. It's actually empirical success um, of, of something that it was already known uh, in support of Newton's theory. Because the reason is that some, you take something that is meant to be known, one of the of what of Klepper's law, then you take a new theory, and then it turns out you don't have to accommodate anything. It's not a doc. It turns out you get something else right. Okay, so that's that's one reason why. Okay, now to the extent that Kripke is the Newton of Lewis and Langsford, which I which I don't know, it might be true or not. If that's right, then then this is basically what I meant. So it's it, it might not be the same theory in, in something like this sense. But but again, I'm not really sure whether this is the case. So sorry, there was just I couldn't I couldn't help uh, saying saying that. But uh. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe something that's relevant to this is that I don't think all of the Lewis and Langford systems turned out to be. Um, easily accounted for um, with the Kripke semantics. So the ones that we tend to study now, um, like um, S4 and S5, um, uh, T fell out super easily, but I think there are some like older um, Lewis and Langford systems that basically got ignored afterwards because they didn't fit so naturally into this thing. And, and um, yeah, so maybe maybe that's a good reason to say that actually, um, if we're looking at the whole Lewis and Langford project, um, it's different from um, the, the Kripke system. Um, yeah, okay, I'll stop talking, thanks. Th thank you, everybody. Um, following this, this spirit of um, having analogies with the methodology of, of science, I was wondering, uh, how should we understand or how should we interpret the success of certain non-classical logics in particular contexts? Like when they are extremely successful compared to, for instance, classical logics. Should we have realist commitments as sometimes happens in the sciences? Should we uh, still be uh, endorse weak doxastic commitments? What, what are your thoughts on this? And maybe we can match the question with the negative part, which is um, what happens when a logic fails? What in an expected or unintended domain of application, what should we get from that? So uh, as we get the intuition in, in the sciences that when a theory is failing at addressing its intended domain of application, something is going on with the theory that it's uh, messy or that it has to be fixed or that this should be abandoned in the worst case scenario. So which are your thoughts on the positive and the negative sides of, su of success and failure of, of logical theories in particular domains? Um, um, any, any of you want to start? Peter, please. Yeah, um, so well, first of all, I would say that that it's a problem for logic that we are so that it's so difficult to say that a non-classical logic fails. Um, often people think that uh, certain non-classical logics have already failed fifty years ago, and they're then all of a sudden people are still are working again on it. Uh, so there are no no clear criteria of failure and success. I mean, that might, that might be technical failures, like like when a system internally turns out to be you 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 claim that it was sound and complete, but that it does it turns out to be not at all sound and complete. But often these things can be be corrected and so on, and you keep on working with these systems. Uh, um, I mean, there's it's very difficult to abandon a logic uh, um, exactly because it's so foundational in some in in, in a sense. Uh, um, it's almost hard to 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 reject the logic without proper question begging, without without using somewhere some form of question begging. Um, so so I, I think I think we maybe maybe it would be useful if 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 logicians or those who apply logics um, would be more clear about what is supposed to is a logic supposed to be doing. So that somebody else or themselves they can evaluate whether their success or failure, um, 
and 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 then that's maybe not the reason to abandon a logic completely afterwards but at least um it it, it gives a sort of a more um a clearer way to 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 evaluate a, a success of, 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 of logical systems um so so i don't think yeah i think for now it's, it's very difficult to find cases where logic have clearly failed or have been really successful um, in particular domains um, but I, I think i think it's important to 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 try to reach that point where we can say it it, it, uh, it is successful or it's, it fails it's not a really answer to your question but <laughs> it's it's a skeptical answer to to the question <laughs> So uh, any any of you, Luis, maybe you want to say something about how both the failure and the success of a logic sent us to trivialism or something like that. Yeah, in fact, uh, well, no, I, I'm coming from a different place, right? Uh, uh, for several years, I studied uh, category theory, uh, especially topos theory. And there you have uh, something like a mathematical universe. And among the claims that uh, such people uh, make is that the internal logic of uh, those mathematical universes uh, is intuitionistic, at least. And it, it might go from intuitionistic to classical logic, right? Uh, so that might look like uh, an example of success of some logics, right? Uh, because you can precisely say what is the logic for that mathematical universe. But that's not exactly true. Because in, in order to say so, uh, you need to put some logic into the mathematical universe. And once you remove that, you can make another logic fit uh, that mathematical universe. So in a sense, uh, you can say that the mathematical universe is uh, compatible with two logics. It, it's the closest thing that I have seen as um, an actual case of uh, logical pluralism, right? At least two logics for exactly the same domain. It's not real life. It's not like going to the store and uh, applying two different logics for buying tomatoes or something like that, but it, it's it's the closest that I, that I have got. Uh, so what kind of commitments uh, one can have when finding cases of success or, or failure. I would say the weakest um, <laughs> epistemic commit commitment as possible. Um, because, um, yeah, you can say uh, that there is some structural similarity between uh, the logic and the domain, but that's all. Uh, uh, Yes, I, 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 I wouldn't go uh, further because uh, yes, even if in, in, in those cases, the mathematical cases that uh, were uh, the most appropriate to have perfect match, uh, they are not. So I would go for the weakest uh, epistemic claim <laughs> always. Thank you, Luis. Um, Gillian or Vincenzo, do you have any thoughts on, on this last question? Gillian, please. So, um, if we think that, that classical logic fails sometimes, and that's a pretty standard thing for non-classical logicians to think, um, so maybe you're a dialetheist and you think that modus ponens and distinctive syllogism are not valid, or maybe you're a strong cleaning logician and you think that none of the classical logical truths are really valid. But um, if you are um, a power consistent logician, you're presumably going to think that K3, the strong cleaning logic, um, fails as well. 
because it endorses distinctive syllogism and modus ponens. So it's going to fail just the same way the classical logic does. And on the other hand, if you're a um, strong cleaning logician, then dialetheism has all the same, or practices and logics like LP have all the same logical truth. And so you're going to think, well, there's where LP goes wrong, right? So there's, if, if classical logic can fail in these ways, then these weaker logics can fail in these ways as well, even though it's, it's harder to find instances where they fail because they're weaker. Um, I think the issue is complicated by the fact that there's this standard thought that logic has to be completely general and that unless something is completely general, it doesn't count as a logic. Um, so that it almost doesn't make sense to say that um, like certain logics hold in some domains um, um, and not in others. And so that you can't have this sort of um, either domain sensitive approach to logic or something that I'm a bit more sensitive to like sort of a language sensitive um, approach to logic so that you know richer languages get weaker logics and um, uh, more uh, simple languages like maybe the language of arithmetic can have nice strong logics like, like classical logic. Um, so I think if you really um, stay committed to this view that logics have to be completely general, then it's easier for these logics to fail because you only need one counterexample from any language or any domain. And now that's not a logic. And so it's sort of um, uh, more likely that you'll end up as some kind of nihilist if you're committed to this kind of um, generalism. Whereas if you say, okay, if we do that, we're not going to have any logic left. So let's allow logics to be language specific or domain specific. Um, then you're more likely to end up as, as like some kind of pluralist or kind of a relativist about logic where you think, okay, maybe classical logic's great for mathematics um, or certain parts of mathematics. Um, but as soon as we start introducing special truth predicates or vague predicates, then we need, I don't know, FDE or something else. T thank you, Gillian. So um, it, it is time to close this um, this part of the session. So if you have any final thoughts, Vincenzo, if you want to address the last question or to say something uh, to close your your participation before we move to the Q&A, uh, please feel free to- No problem, to... really. We can, we can go on. Thank you. Okay, so um, if, if any of you have something else that you want to say before we move to the Q&A. You can say it now or yes, Liz. Yes, uh, just something short about the uh, methodology thing. I think it's, uh, it's great that uh, we are trying to adapt uh, the methodology from the empirical science to the case of logic. I think we can learn a lot uh, about uh, by doing that. Um, but uh, uh, Peter said something very important about logic, and it's uh, uh, it's that uh, logic is uh, dynamic. I would say that uh, we also will, uh, would learn a lot by taking the history of logic very seriously. Because uh, yes, uh, one has to one has to start somewhere, but we didn't start with classical logic. Classical logic was not there; uh, has not been there forever. Um, uh, theory by Aristotle is uh, a special thing, but in the Middle Ages, the logical theory was surely uh, very different. And uh, even in the nineteenth century, uh, logical theories uh, were not exactly classical. So maybe uh, going into the, into the history of logic and uh, looking uh, what motivated the changes and how they were made uh, might provide some valuable insights into the theory choice and all that stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, so if there are no further comments from any of you four, we can move. Yes, Gillian. Sorry, just um, one thing I wanted to ask Luis after what he was saying is, do you feel the same way about pre-Newtonian physics? 
like, should we go back and talk to, or like, you know, interact with the readings of scientists who uh, were following Aristotle, but hadn't yet, um, you know, had a system as, as uh, pretty as the Newtonian mechanics. Um, would that help us with physics now? You know, I, I would say uh, if we want to learn something about uh, theory change in physics, definitely we would go. We should go to learn about the dispute between uh, Aristotelians and some other guys, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a topic: uh, theory change in physics. If you are asking uh, if we can learn something valuable about the logical notions by reading those ancient uh, thinkers? I would say yes in the case of logic. And I don't know enough physics, but maybe in physics that's the case too. I, I don't know. For In the case of, lo of logic, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's worthy. I, I don't know about uh, physics. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, um, okay, with that, let's move to the Q&A. We have already a question that was especially directed to Luis, but uh, any of you can, can answer to it. It's by Miguel Leon Antiveros. Uh, by the way, everybody can already open their cameras and their mics. And if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand in participants, raise your hand or send a message to the chat. So Miguel asks, initially Luis, but anybody can answer. Why do we must accept mathematical demonstration obtained by classical? What does that mean? And why must we accept mathematical? Oh, that's, that's the same question. So it was repeated twice. And so Luis, uh, I think he was referring to your first question about uh, what, what we take from classical logic to be like good or uh, worth of being uh, pursued in, even when changing logics, maybe that was the context of his question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the short answer is, I, I don't think we must accept uh, classical proof. Uh, maybe I would say that uh, if we are giving the rules of the game and uh, we are saying, okay, Prove it and prove this uh, by classical means. Uh, then, in that case, we must accept the classical proof. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, mathematics and uh, is uh, is full of problems on on its own. And if you start mixing uh, mathematics and standards of proof with non-classical logics, <laughs> something is going to uh, uh, something bad is going to happen very quickly. Yes, uh, but uh, short answer, uh, I don't think we must accept it, right? And because there are other ways of doing mathematics. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, any of you have any any thoughts on that particular question? If not, we can move to the second question, which is by Moises. Moises, um, you can open your mic. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is a question for everyone, I guess, on a related issue, but um, I mean, I guess I have a couple of questions, but the, but the first one will be about something that Luis mentioned. So he, he mentioned that we should uh, pay attention to hi the history of logic. Uh, and so I want to take the opportunity to draw attention to the history of modern logic, right? So modern logic was, you know, born with uh, Frege and Russell, but even going further back, you know, the, the Italian uh, logicians, you know, the piano, the piano school. So you can, for example, go to uh, Russell's uh, principles of mathematics and see uh, early discussions about whether we should have a membership relation, what's the meaning of the membership relation, what do we, what should we think about the singleton, and so on, right? I, and, and all of these were foundational questions about uh, that certain research program. So, so I guess, I mean, I guess the point that I want to go 
here too is that uh, if you, for example, if you contrast how, for example, Russell was thinking about logic and its primitives, or Frege was thinking about logic and its primitives, uh, or the piano, the piano school, or even Pierce, you know, who had like a more algebraic approach. Even though all of them were agreed on the on some of the theorems and results of classical logic, uh, they thought about it as you know very you know from very different systems and very different conceptual primitives. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, what, like, what are the I mean. Uh, you know, from, from the contemporary standpoint, I guess we individuate the logic by the theorems, but I guess I will want, the, I will want to know what they think about the relation between, um, you know, the, the, the primitives that a logic has, you know, the, the, the way it, it, it is set up and uh, whether that, whether that, whether we should think of all of these systems as classical logic just because they, they say, uh, I guess, the, the same sort of inferences. Um, so I, yeah, I guess that's, that will be my first question. That's sort of sort of motivated by the early history of modern logic. Yeah. I mean, Maria, so, yeah. I think. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, please go go ahead, Gillian. That's okay. I. I tend to think of them as different formulations of the same logic, like at least if they agree on the inference relations. So um, with people like Frege and Russell and Whitehead, we um, tend to think of them as um, sort of Frege Hilbert axiomatic systems. Um, and with people like Genson coming along and showing how to generalize those kind of systems like natural deduction systems or sequence calculus systems. Um, and then through Tarski, like model theoretic approaches to capturing the same logic, like the same entailment relations. Um, you know, in some ways they're different theories and in some ways, at least I'm assuming this is the idea, they captured the same logic. Um, I'm happy to think of these as like different formulations of um, the same system. And maybe you want to like individuate theories in a more fine grained way, in which case we'd say, you know, they're different theories that generate the same logic. Um, but uh, since they come up with the same logic, why not call them all classical? Like, is there a more um, like fundamental difference between them that should, that should stop us from doing that? I mean, I guess my, my thought here is that, um... I'm sympathetic to the like the individuation criteria of taking the theorems to be a, uh, to singling out a logic, I guess. But I guess uh, the, the 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 thing that I was thinking about here was once you start thinking about logic in connection to other disciplines, like for example, uh, you know, a number of of you mentioned the connections to logic to to science or to mathematics or to metaphysics, right? So once you start doing that, it turns out that. Um, so many of those, many of the different primitives that were playing some role there had like a special connection to some mathematical practice or some metaphysical supposition assumption that some people had. Uh, so, for example, uh, just like to give an example, Frege had like the intuition that functions were like the basic notion, right? So he built up he built up his logic uh, to respect that idea, and uh, Russell had like the intuition that there were no classes, so he built up his logic with the idea that you should just eliminate classes with the theory of descriptions. So I guess um, it might, I mean, it, as, 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 uh, so this is, this is what I will say. What I will say is that I am sympathetic with the criterion of individuation for applications of logic, but I'm wondering whether there might be some, um, some upshot for uh, thinking about logic as, as applied to the sciences, mathematics or metaph metaphysics that, that comes down to the, to the type of primitives it has. Um, yeah. But, and just, I mean, just, just to, just note, to notice is that this, this is not, this, do, this does have some bite because, for example, if you really take seriously the analogy of logic with physics, uh, then if you go to physics and you see the sort of systems that they build, for example, when they're talking about space time or, or matter or et cetera, you will notice that they also use, you know, axioms and theorems and so on. But the, the sort of primitives that they have in place uh, certainly inform of the ways in which they, uh, what structures they take to be fundamental. 
So if you if you really think about anti-exceptionalism for logic holes, then perhaps you should, you are you have some pressure to to side with the physicists and adopt that criteria for logic too. Thank you, Misa. So, um, any any of you want to say something? Um, maybe Luis. Yes, it, it's uh, it's a problem. I, I I have I have been dealing with it for some time now, because in in a sense I I am tempted to say that they are not the same theory. But on the other hand, there is the extensionalist pressure saying to me, well, they are just uh, the same collection of valid arguments, right? In that sense, it's just the same theory. Uh, I, 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 I am not sure. I, I, um, maybe give me one year more, one more year, and I will tell you something more elaborate. But. Uh, just consider um, um, this example to take uh, Frege's theory uh, about uh, extensions of concepts. Is it the same theory as the theory containing uh, just one rule of derivation, gamma, therefore P for every gamma and P? Yeah. Well, in a, in a sense it is because both are the trivial logic, right? But uh, I don't know. I, I, I think there, there is something to the way of presenting uh, the things that makes them different theories. But I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, my heart and my brain are divided here. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Moises. Anybody else wants to say something before we move uh, from this question? Not? OK. Yes, Vincenzo, were, were you? No? Um, okay. So um, the next question is by Alejandro Estrada, but, but Alejandro cannot open his mic. So uh, his question is, how do we evaluate the research carried out on non-classical logics today? And what he is questioning is really, do we have any clear methodology to say uh, whether logic is moving forward, uh, whether logic is getting mature or not, and so on and so forth. So um, maybe um, any of you want to, to answer? Peter, you wanted to answer the last one or? Um, yeah, but- Do you want to say something already, about both? Yes. Yeah, we've already passed to another, but, but maybe we just- no, I but, want to say that- But you can, you can go back, yes. Okay. Um, no, I just think that it's dangerous to individuate logics. I don't think there's much uh, to have like sort of absolute criteria for individuating logics. I think that's rather uh, difficult given the complexity of the subjects. Um, so it's, it's clearly interesting to compare consequence relations or validity relations. Um, but 50 years ago, people, or 80 years ago, people were more thinking of sets of theorems, uh, of tautologies. Um, that's an option. You can compare logics, you can compare whether they give the same set. Um, so you can compare the truth tables, the, 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 the matrices in general, whether they are the same. Uh, so there's a, a lot of things you can compare. And I like to see logic as like uh, uh, being a very complex structure of, uh, of, of some proof techniques, some, some semantic aspects, and some logical relations, uh, truth preservation, uh, validity, and they might not be the same, for example, uh, a tautology, logical truth, or logical falsehoods, and so on. And, and it's a complex structure, and, 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 and trying to individuate them sometimes might be more harmful than, than, than giving us actually something. Uh, but it's very important to, of course, see similarities between logics and say, well, actually, here we find the same set of tautologies. This gives us the same uh, uh, proofs, basically. This uh, uh, may be characterized by the same matrices and so on. Um, so comparing is important, but individuating is a bit uh, re reductive, I think. Uh, that's just a small thing I wanted to add to the previous discussion. Uh, but then on the, on the evaluation of uh, classical logic today, um, I think as far as I can judge, uh, the, the, the most important uh, aspect that, that, that 
logic has brought us is an enormous toolbox um, and advanced technical tools. Um, uh, so we now more or less know uh, what we can do with intuitionistic logic, what we can do with classical logic. You know, a lot of uh, um, properties of them. Uh, uh, we know uh, several ways to characterize per consistent solutions and so on. Um, I think this is the main uh, progress made for now is like offering a gigantic, well-developed toolbox and I think for the application of that toolbox to either metaphysics, uh, computer science, or, or uh, more empirical sciences, uh, um, or epistemology in general, uh, I, I think there is still a long way to go there. Um, uh, but but if, if you have to evaluate the success, I think it's that technical toolbox, I think that's the main uh, uh, success it has obtained. I don't say the only, but uh, uh, the most important global um, success. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, um, for your two answers. Do any of you want to say something else about Alejandro's question? If not, we can move to the next one, which is going to be by Gabriel. Gabriel, can you please speak now? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maria. And thanks everybody for this uh, great event. <laughs> it's been terrific. Uh, this question is, uh, well, in a way it, would, it could be addressed to Gillian Russell in specific since she wrote uh, a few years ago, uh, a paper called Logic Isn't Normative. And uh, it kept me thinking for the past few weeks and throughout this uh, conversation. But I would, uh, of course, I would like it if, if herself or anyone else could uh, say something about this. Uh, the thing is, um, well, classical logic, uh, of course, cannot model uh, natural language with precision. And uh, we cannot really think of a particular logic that can model reasoning. And well, the thing is, uh, Probably there is not uh, a logic that by itself could be considered normative. But the question is, um, is there any better candidate actually? Um, I mean, because of course we cannot just assume that um, general claims as uh, maybe earlier in this conversation it was mentioned, but uh, empirically, we sort of want <laughs> something that resembles that generality of uh, classical logic. So, so, so the question it would be, um, okay, uh, classical logic or logic itself, it is not normative and it cannot make uh, general claims. But if it is not logic, then which other science can do that job? Of course, I am not implying that there should be one, but the question might be, uh, is there anything better, actually? Hi, Gabriel. Yes, it's nice to see you. Um, OK, so the claim that logic isn't normative, right, which I endorse. Um, So I'm just trying to figure out where to begin. Um, maybe I should start with um, some of the things that you were saying. Um, so one of the things you said was um, classical logic can't, uh, maybe the way to think of it is model um, natural language with precision. So for example, probably the classical conditional is different from um, the natural language conditional is certainly different from the subjunctive natural language conditional. Um, and then um, it can't model uh, reasoning. And that almost seems to suggest that the reason logic isn't normative or the reason classical logic isn't normative is that it's wrong, right? And that seems to presuppose that its job was either to model natural language or to model reasoning. 
So let me start by saying that that's not my reason for thinking that logic isn't normative, right? So we can assume that classical logic is 100% correct. Maybe not the only correct logic, but, but there's nothing wrong with it. It makes no mistakes. Um, and I still wouldn't think classical logic is normative. Um, so the reason for that is um, partly that I reject the standard arguments for thinking that classical logic is normative, or any logic is normative. Um, so people often say things like, well, entailment claims have normative consequences. So for example, um, if you believe um, that snow is white and you believe that if snow is white, then grass is green, then you ought to believe that grass is green because that's entailed by um, what you already believe. Um, or uh, people say, if you believe that a certain set of sentences is inconsistent, then you ought not to believe every um, sentence in the set. Um, but I was a grad student at Princeton and like all other grad students at Princeton at that time, I was forced to read Gil Harmon's work on this topic, uh, pointing out that um, it's not the case that you ought to believe the consequences of modus ponens if you already believe the premises um, because it could be that the thing on the right hand side of that entailment relation is inconsistent. It could be something that you already believe the negation of, right? And since in those cases, it's not true that you ought to believe the conclusion. It's not generally true that if you believe the premises and the conclusion follows from those premises, you ought to believe that. Um, so one of the things is, you know, I accept the standard examples against the standard links between entailment claims and claims about normativity. But then, um, I also think that when you look at what logic actually does, so you look at what somebody does when they like lay out a logic, right? They specify a particular language and they um, maybe, you know, one way of doing it, they give a set of models and they show how to interpret that language on the models. And then um, they define um, truth in the model and entailment. And then you get an entailment relation um, on that language. And all of that to me looks like a descriptive project. First of all, it's, it's like not obviously about reasoning. It seems to be about like sentences in this language, which ones of them are true, and when, you know, whether or not truth is preserved over certain transitions, right? And that seems like a descriptive project the same way um, if you're studying heat in physics, you're interested in like, you know, which things have this property of heat and how is it preserved over certain kinds of transitions? And if you get that right, then your theory is right. So I think of logic as like the descriptive theory of truth preservation over sentences. Um, it's been really standard historically, I think, to confuse that with questions about reasoning, which I take to be questions about appropriate transitions in belief um, for people. Like, if you believe these things, should you believe those other things? Um, but I um, accept the point that lots of the commentators have made um, here today that that is both a different subject and a like seriously difficult subject. So I think it was Lewis that was saying, um, uh, almost like that's too much for me. I can't, take, I can't take on that. But that's a really serious, important and different project. Um, and we should give that the respect it deserves and all the um, work in say, I don't know, psychology and economics and decision theory and um, work on like human limitations that are relevant to like what you ought to believe given what you already believe and new inputs that you get um, are super important. And, like one of the ways in which reasoning comes apart from logic, and this is another point from Harmon, is that it's often the case that when you get some new input that should lead to you giving up something that you believe. But certainly the logics that I study are all monotonic and it doesn't destroy the entailment relation to add um, some new thing to um, the set of premises. And so, um, the way I do logic anyway, um, it doesn't have the right kind of structure to be um, studying like belief revision or inference or, or something like that. Um, so uh, um, the reason I don't think logic is that I think it's the descriptive theory of, um, um, of truth preservation. Um, and it doesn't matter to me too much that classical logic like isn't successful as a theory of reasoning because I don't think that's what it set out to be in the first place. 
Um, does that answer your question, Gabrielle? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. It was terrific. Th right. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Gabrielle. So if any of you want to answer this question, that's okay. But uh, because I said that we were just going to be here two hours. Uh, Vincenzo has has to leave like in seven minutes. So uh, what I propose is to go through Kevin's question. Then we also have Deborah's question. And then uh, any of you can answer any of each, the one that you want. So if Vincenzo wants to give an answer before leaving, then he can do so. Um, is that okay with every of you? See? Okay. So uh, Kevin, please. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, everything's been really amazing and fascinating so far. So I, I guess I want to ask a question about something Gillian raised, though, you know, anyone can answer, and I don't know that Gillian was necessarily endorsing anything in particular, but but she did say something. So, um, um, so I, I'm interested in this question of, you know, whether we should think of there as being one sort of logic, which perhaps, for example, we think of as the most general of subject matters, um, or whether we should think of the, you know, there as, as being sort of multiple logics that are perhaps subject um, domain specific. And so, you know, I, I have to admit, and I'm sort of embarrassed to admit that I do feel attracted to this more conservative position of there just being sort of one logic. And, you know, often when people are talking about whatever the logic of information or the logic of imperatives or the logic of X, Y, and Z. I, I, I sort of have this sort of sneaking suspicion that there's a slight abuse of notation and they're not really talking about when they're talking about the logic of imperatives. I mean, it's true that there's a, a certain structure there that's sort of logical in some ways, but that deviates in, from things in other ways. But, but there's just sort of a clever almost misreading of the um, connectives, perhaps in order to bring out something interesting. But in, in some sense, you know, it's it, uh, the idea of there being sort of one overarching logic is not refuted by the fact that in certain domains, there are these structural similarities and dissimilarities with how we might want, want to think of logic more universally. But I don't know. Um, can any of you push push back on on that a little bit, um, or, or do you, do any of you have any thoughts on this question about right one logic versus many logics? Thank you, thank you, Kevin. And before any of you want to answer that one, I will read uh, Deborah's question, which is: uh, Which logical principles do you think are the most worth preserving among the non-classical logic system uh, systems? So. If any of you have an answer to Kevin's question or to Deborah's one, uh, or even if you want to address Gabrielle's one, um, you are very welcome. But if Vincenzo wants to say something before he leaves, that's even better. Um, well, that, that was a difficult one to me, the one about one versus many. I, I also have like, I would like to be, I would like it to be the case that there is only one. Um, but but uh, I'm I'm not in a position to, to really make an argument in favor of that of this monism. Um, one way out is of course to say that if there is more than one right theory, it's because they're talking about different things, uh, and they are capturing uh, appropriately uh, different different objects of study. But but I realize this is I mean um, I'm just mentioning this because. Um, I have the impression that sometimes some of the arguments given in, in favor of, of pluralism might be resisted by, by following this, this route. Um, and, uh, but it's a very, it's a very you know, uh, vague and, and uh, sort of uh, messy general point that um, doesn't, doesn't convey much more than my, than my um, sort of uninformed inclinations and, and, and a general sympathy for monism when, when it's possible to pursue something like that. Um, but that's, that's all, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Vincenzo. And it was great having you. If you have to live without saying goodbye, it was great having you. I'm, 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 really, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. This was, this was great. But as, as I said, this is, this is 7 p.m. around here and it's, it's still not over. So... Um, Thanks again, and, and really uh, apologies for, 
for living. Thank you. Now, Gillian, uh, do you have an answer to, to this question or to any of the questions? Um, I, I have an ambition to try and answer both questions together. Um, so let me try. Um, I also feel the pull to have like one logic that would be neat, that would be uh, really nice. Um, and then uh, I also feel that when people use like the logic of X, that half the time I just don't quite know what they mean or don't wanna know what they mean by logic in that case. I think there are some cases where I do get it. So when people talk about the logic of the quantifiers, right? And then moving from talking about the logic of the truth functors to talking about the logic of the quantifiers, I'm like, okay, now we're gonna do like quantifiers and how that affects the entailment relation. And then they're like, okay, we could add in the logic of the modal operators or the logic of indexicals, right? That would be really interesting how that affects the entailment relation. So I'm, I'm okay with like that kind of logic of, but then I start to get worried that the more expressions we include, especially when we start including things like um, self-referential expressions and truth predicates and vague predicates um, and deck skills as well, that um, this is gonna like irreparably weaken the logic. And here's where um, this is also gonna be a response to Whose question was it about which classical principles do we really want to keep? Um, Deborah's question. Deborah's question. So like, when I think about, um, actually something even Vincenzo was saying right at the beginning about the value of classical logic, I think about how much it helped me when I was trying to understand proofs in other classes early on, where they'd be, you know, we're doing uh, physics or applied math or something, and suddenly somebody's proving a conditional by proving the contrapositive. And, you know, at some point, maybe you like learn that as like an algorithm, I'm allowed to prove conditionals this way. And then when you study it in logic, you're like, wait, no, now I really get it. I see why I'm allowed to do like this kind of proof or how reductio works or exactly like why disjunctive syllogism or proving things from cases, right, is, is good. And I don't want to lose that part of logic. Like, like that was the part that seemed like rich, that connected to other things, that was kind of like unified with other bits of human knowledge. Um, and so um, when Deborah asked like, what bits of classical logic do you want to lose? I'm like, I don't want to lose any of that. I like, I like all of that. And then, you know, the other stuff like identity or conjunction elimination or whatever, that, that's, that's even closer to the core, right? So if I, if I don't want to lose disjunctive syllogism, I definitely want to hang on to um, conjunction elimination. Um, and so now I seem to have these completely competing things, right? I, I want to look at the logics of richer expressions um, so that, you know, I look at indexical logics or, um, um, you know, free logics if we have expressions that don't refer. Um, but there's, and this is a sort of standard move for a pluralist to make. Then there's this worry that it's all going to collapse into a kind of logical nihilism where either, either nothing follows from anything or your logic is so weak that it's not very useful, right? And that the most like important kind of usefulness is I'd like to be able to use it in applied math and physics and like other kinds of subjects where it's useful to be able to prove stuff. Um, and so there's kind of a, a push for maybe a kind of language relative pluralism, like in subjects where your language is straightforward enough for you to have say classical logic, um, then, go for it, use classical logic. Um, because if your language is sufficiently impoverished, I mean, it seems weird to call the language of physics impoverished, but if it doesn't have vague predicates or it doesn't have things that fail to refer, you know, feel free to go ahead and use classical logic. But if you want to include some of these more complicated things, then you're going to need a weaker logic. Thank you, Gillian. Um, Luis, Peter, do you want to answer to any of the questions? Yes, yeah. Peter. Maybe. Well, about monism, uh, I, I I think I um, quite agree with with Gillian um, that uh, language specific um, logics could be developed, and that then you get a sort of plurality of logics. But depending on 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 the, the specific languages, uh, I think that's a nice and not just language. I think it's a bit further from it's a bit beyond that. Uh, um, I think other contextual matters might 
play a role than just uh, a language. Um, but there is something that I'm very much struggling with and I've always been struggling with. It seems that there should be something that uh, can move beyond the contexts uh, that, that we can um, that even if even though we, we change part of our language, if we if we move, if we start using uh, vague predicates and lexicals and so on, and then uh, a modal language and, and, and so on, um, the, the, and, and then maybe we come in domains where it's more uh, paradox, uh, they are more paradox uh, prone. Uh, well, then then we want to we, we want to we want to maybe uh, go to a language that is more um, or we, we automatically use language that allows for another logic but nevertheless there seems to be something that is constant going to these uh, I mean we seem we seem to be able to use uh, similar um, like there are some coherence there's ideally some coherence in reality that 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 could be go beyond all these contexts. And um, maybe we shouldn't stop striving to find like a true logic, whatever it is, um, and then try to specify correctly where, um, what the reasons are, why specific contexts are asked for a, a different uh, um, well, changes to, to, to the language and to the logic. Uh, so, so I'd like to maybe go for both uh, starts, try to develop sort of a, a monist uh, true logic of deduction, and then try to say, well, this context is specific because there you're safe from paradoxes, for example. This context is specific because you have uh, precisely defined language. This, cost, uh, this topic is specific because there you are using I, I, uh, indexicals and so on. Like, I think that there's something nice about still believing that that there is some unity under all this uh, uh, very weird changes uh, that happen across contexts. Uh, so, I'd like to be a little bit in between. Uh, Monism and pluralism. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, Luis, do you want to say something? We are wrapping up, so. Yeah, but rather about uh, Deborah's question. Um, well, if we understand the expression logical principles as uh, logically valid arguments, um, I would say not, none, because there are no such things, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical uh, about the idea that there are uh, logically valid arguments, uh, uh, arguments that are uh, valid everywhere in all contexts and so on. Yeah, but that's a different discussion. Yeah. If we understand uh, logical principles in a more general way, well, and I, I would say that something like the idea that um, uh, the value of a conjunction is uh, just um, the infimum of the values of the components should be there. Someone might, might say, okay, but that would deliver a uh, conjunction simplification. And I, I would say, no, that's not the case. Uh, in, in order to get that, uh, you need uh, a very specific notion of logical consequence, right? Uh, probably truth preservation. But uh, the thing is that I am not sure that uh, logical consequence is truth preservation. I'm almost sure that there is some preservation there. I, I don't know preservation of what, nor in what direction, it might be from premises to conclusion, but, oh, but also from conclusions to the premises. I, I am not sure. There is preservation of some sort, but uh, I don't know the details. So um, yeah, the, uh, 
that kind of logical principles, very abstract, uh, very indeterminate in a sense, uh, I like. And I think that those uh, are worth preserving in many, many logics, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Luis. Uh, thank you, Gillian. Obviously, thank you, Peter. Peter, you have still your mic open. So I was wondering, do you want to say a follow up or something like that? No, 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 sorry, I just forgot to. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so I I think we we have no more time. Um, it says you open your camera. Do you have a follow up on this? Or? Oh, no, I just wanted to thank everyone for their uh, you know, Gillian, Luis, and, and Peter for their insights and their, their interesting discussion. So that, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for you thanking everybody. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, we are so sorry we have no more time, but check out this recording. It's going to be on YouTube. So if you miss any part, it's going to be on our YouTube channel, as well as the video series on non-classical logics. Uh, which started airing yesterday and will keep airing during three weeks of, of July. We have in six tutorials on non-classical logics and we have also other like 10 videos on uh, philosophical reflections on those non-classical logics. So, um, yes? Oh, I just wanted to mention that I'm going to try to add sub subtitles to in Spanish to this. So, at some, you know, at some point because as a grad student, there's much to do, but yeah, that's it. That's the aim so that more people in, uh, from, you know, Latin America can see the content, which is the point, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Moises. <laughs> and Peter is going to add them to um, Dutch, so. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And it was great having you all here. Uh, looking forward to meeting you in the next uh, Loki KMX activity and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.